Welcome to Making Stuff Up, the podcast by the Quinney Arts Council team, where we talk to all kinds of creators about how they got interested in making stuff up. You're here with your hosts, Cody and Heather. This week, we're talking to Christopher Gentile, a photographer with a great background in the film industry. Christopher, welcome to the podcast. Can you please introduce yourself a little bit? Sure. I'm Christopher Gentile. I'm a commercial photographer. Um, I grew up in Prince Edward County, and I still live there. And I've spent the last sort of 40 years uh, in Toronto working in the film industry and then working my way into being a commercial photographer. And now I'm here in Belleville. I moved here two years ago, and my studio is just at 265 Front Street. And uh, we had a space built out there. It's about 1,000 square feet. And that's where I run uh, pretty much 90% of my business is in the studio. Yeah, and the other 10 are on location. I absolutely love your studio. It mm. was such a pleasure to be invited, um, the QAC team, to come down and check it out a few weeks ago. And um, it's just such a cool space. Oh, I just thanks loved very much. it. Yeah, it was, it was cool. great. It was, it was nice to sort of set it up and have it sort of be for photography, you know, the working part of it. But then also having creature comforts, I think, was really key. Mm -hmm. you know, important to have that for clients and a little space to hang out. And we do so many different things I'm sure we'll talk about. But uh, so the studio had to be able to cross over into all kinds of different areas of commercial photography. But yeah, it's a great space. I, I love being there. So it's good. Now, did you create that over COVID or you already had the vision beforehand or how long? I had a studio in Toronto that was uh, very similar to what that space was. So they're usually about a thousand square feet, sort of open concept, high ceilings. And so when I came here, I was, I started looking around to see if I could find something, you know, in the same direction. And, uh, my friend Edie had that space and they, it was basically, as you see it, it just needed a fresh coat of paint and we did some, you know, a little bit of electrical work to it and stuff like that. But in general, it was like, that's, it was sort of perfect for what I was looking for. Yeah. Cool. Well, I, I like the furnishings too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I would love, I feel like every furnishing in your place was unique and had a story to it and it connected yeah. to something that either a project you've worked on before or um, your visions for the future. Yeah, no, it's true. And I think a lot of it is, is, I really believe I like having furnishings and certain pieces that also either have come a prop that has come from a job or a lot of stuff is just to make me feel comfortable and make clients feel comfortable. And so if I feel comfortable, then I feel it that flows into my creative you know, vibe and work. So it's good. It's, I think it's really important. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, so how did you sort of get into photography in the first place? I know you said you grew up in Prince Edward County, which is visually a gorgeous place to live. Did that inspire you or something um, else? Well, I was always a bit of an artistic kid, so I was always into drawing and doing stuff, and I was always daydreaming and staring at things, as my mom liked to say. Um, but basically, it came out of when I was finishing up in high school, uh, there was a film crew that was coming to Prince Edward County to shoot an Ontario tourism commercial, and that was when they were doing that Yours to Discover uh, campaign. And they were looking for sort of tanned bodies that to be outside that had looked like they'd been out there for the summer, and, uh, you know, and, and had been... It's, because the idea was it was early in the season, but they wanted it to look like it was late in the season. So I got a call at the sailing school because I was teaching sailing. And the idea was to basically get some friends together, go out and put a whole bunch of, uh, of my friends in this commercial. We were running up and down the beaches and doing stuff like that. But it actually turned out it was a really interesting job opportunity because at the time it, just, it was just a fun thing for us to do. But it actually turned out that they were a real major player in the film industry, and my plan was to go and study film television production at Sheridan College. And these guys were like, well, if you ever want to come work in the film industry, here's our card, you should come see us. And uh, so uh, then I sort of thought, okay, well, that's kind of interesting. And I didn't think much of it at first, right? And then when I went out west for a little bit to visit my brother, and then I came back and I thought, okay, well, I'll give this a shot. And then so I called these guys up and uh, sure enough, and then I started out and started day one working with those guys. And it's basically television production. So you wind up being like a, a gopher, which is basically go for this, go for that. That's all it stands for, <laughs> which is a production assistant. And then we need know. one of those here. Yeah. <laughs> Wouldn't that be great? Everybody needs a gopher. Yeah. <laughs> everyone needs a personal <laughs> gopher. <laughs> As a gopher from the Sesame Street, right? That's what his original job was. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's exactly what it was. He was a production assistant. Yeah, but so it was interesting because I was always interested in television, and then I'd actually gone to Sheridan for about three months, but the problem was the program wasn't up and running. It was more theater. So then I sort of, I bailed. I had this card. I thought, I'll give these guys a shot. And then when I did, it, and it turned out, and I, it's basically went from there and you basically as a production assistant you just go from one sort of company there was like multiple companies at the time and you're freelance the whole time right so they're just you're doing little projects and, and trying to get more work and more work and, and gain more experience and that just 
kept going and going and going, and then you work through all the different categories, and then you start becoming like, instead of a production assistant, you might be a little assistant, um, a production manager or an assistant director. And then I started working with talent more, working with directors more as an assistant director. And it just kept growing and growing and growing. And then the m most fortunate thing that happened for me was a friend of mine was off to Australia to work on a project and he couldn't do this job. And he said, can you go in and cover it off for three days? And I said, sure. And this was after quite a few years of working in the industry and, and working my way through the, the various different you know, jobs. And I was an assistant director at the time, so I had to go in and basically working with a director, running the floor, organizing the shoots, working with talent, and, and uh, basically a full-up commercial. So I went there for three days, and that turned into almost like 10 years of working at that company. And it just kept growing and growing. And the neat thing was the guy's name was Derek Van Lint and uh, amazing cinematographer, worked with Ridley Scott. He was the cinematographer on Alien, and uh, a really a great mentor to work with because he was really passionate, too, about uh, teaching people his craft. Yeah. We were reading up a little bit about your time with Van Lint, and it looks like you had the opportunity to travel not just to Australia, but many places around the world. Do, did you have any uh, memories of your favorite place to work as a cinematographer, or... Um, well, as an as a, as assistant director, which I was doing with the shoots, basically, you know, Canada was always amazing. Out West was amazing. But we were doing down to the Caribbean a lot. So nice. that we went to a lot of places in the Caribbean. And we would be, like, down in Jamaica, the Tobago Keys, um, P uh, Petite St. Vincent. And it was a great spot to go because of the time difference was pretty much the same. And um, also, it was, it was a, an easy get-to. But it was different traveling then because there was no like restrictions. So you, we were taking like 25, 30 crew with us all the time, traveling wow. with film. And then, you know, we'd, we'd have a production assistant actually, we'd shoot during the day. And then when the film was shot that day, a lot of times we would put it on a plane with a, a production assistant and they'd fly back to Toronto to get it processed. And which they kept, they were just flying all week back and forth a lot of times. So it was, it was kind of interesting. There was a lot of, but then you just go to the airport, people say, oh, you're a film shoot? Okay, yeah, go ahead. It was like, no problem, man. It was very different. Yeah. 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 But it was neat to travel around. Yeah, we were, mainly the Caribbean was most of the time in Canada. I did a shoot in Greece, which was really, really nice. And then um, stills out in Hawaii and things like that. But most of my stills photography now has always been here in Canada. Yeah. 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 So do you find that there's like a different pace of work in the Quinty region or a smaller town versus like the, the bigger city productions? You know, it's, it's actually interesting that you ask that because... I've talked about that a few times with people, and I would say since coming here in two years, even with COVID, but in the last little while, I would say it's almost, the pace is almost the same. There's so much work in the area, and you don't realize that until you actually get here, and you sort of think, oh, I'm coming to a smaller town, and it's gonna be, it's gonna be a little harder to access, and, and so you plan on that, and you think, what well, can you get, because you have to build a client list up, but I think that, um, once I got here, I was really surprised by the amount of work that was actually in the area. And uh, there's enough work, I think, to go around for everybody, which is which is great. But also, it's really nice about a smaller area. It's, it's much easier to access people. So in Toronto, it's very difficult to get through the door. And mm -hmm. so most people are like, so if you're trying to show your book around or your reel or meet with people, it just cha that changed mainly uh, in, let's say, the last 20 years. Because before that, there weren't as many people in the industry. And now there's so many people in, in the field of photography that it's made it really hard to get into agencies. Yeah. But yeah, to your question though, I think uh, being out here, it's really, uh, it's been a really great environment to be in. Yeah, I'm jumping because I love hearing you talk about film. I know you're commercial photography yeah. now, but um, at what, where was the transition from commercial uh, from film to photography for you? Well, it was interesting because in it that happened in the commercial industry. So when I was directing commercials, so after I went through all this of joining film companies and working for them and being a production assistant then being an assistant director and then getting into being the head of production at McWaters Film Company and running that and as an assistant director and then turning into directing we were always shooting on motion picture film 35 mil motion picture and then digital took over even in that world and so that turned out that we were shooting with digital film cameras and so the, the transition was about the same for me when I was shooting film cameras at that time in the motion picture world when they were going digital, everyone was starting to go digital with cameras. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it was a pretty easy transition. I think what's really interesting about it is that people forget that uh, a lot of cameras, even a digital camera you buy today, has a real soul. So they're like film. So as a 
professional photographer, you usually go looking for a camera that has film quality to it in the sensor itself. So it's, it's, I'm always still looking for that advantage that gives me that film look. Because film for me is softer. Mm-hmm. And it, it, you know, it's, just, it's much more forgiving. Digital can be extremely sharp and uh, sometimes scary <laughs> when you're shooting yeah. portraits. <laughs> yeah. um, what's your take on is the, the product of your artistry um, is how, how does technology play a role in that? Is it the person behind the technology? Or is it the technology itself that's helping create your vision? Um, I think the technology helps a little bit and that the cameras are produce really interesting files and stuff like that. But for me, it's always been more about the art form and it's more about the gear is sort of second. I mean, you need it to, you know, obviously you need a light and you need a camera. But if I set my camera here on the table, it's not going to do anything. It's just going to sit there until I tell, you know, I decide what I want it to do, what I want, you know, the f-stop to be, what lens I want to put on it. And it's the same thing for with lighting and stuff like that. They're all they're very helpful tools. There's lots of really interesting stuff that can make your lighting better. Can you know? There's lenses that are sharper or lenses that have very interesting color tone to them. There's and like I say, with the digital cameras, they you know they have sensors that create very filmic looking things. But for me, it's always still always been about the art form. It's mm-hmm. like yeah, it, it, I think unless you can, if you're shooting a portrait, it's about where you place the light, how you place your subject matter. There's so many little teeny tweaks. Um, and then it's that relationship that you build on set, talking to someone and then finding finding that right little moment to pull the trigger. Yeah, And that's the same thing with product. I mean, product photography, people think, oh, well, it doesn't really have a soul, but it's quite interesting. I think, you know, some product photography can be extremely challenging, but it's the same way. It's, for me, it's, it's art direction, art direction, art direction, and lighting, yeah. Yeah, recently in Belleville, we had the Downtown Outdoor Festival, mm-hmm. and I saw you taking pictures for um, for the fashion show, yeah. and I noticed how physical the job is, yeah. because you were right down there on the red yeah. carpet, yeah. and horizontal and everything, and can you tell us about like the physical toll of being a photographer? Yeah, it really is. I mean, for years, we were always working on concrete floors, and so that was always tough. Sometimes we'd be lucky in a studio if we had a wood floor. But it is interesting, and I, it's a great question because after every shoot I usually do, especially when I shoot portraits and stuff, but the fashion show, I think that was like 45 minutes, and I had shot 1,800 frames, I think, in the 45 minutes. Wow. Yeah. And a lot of that is because you're they're moving so fast, and you're just trying to pull the trigger. And, I mean, obviously thinking about the shot and thinking about composition and thinking about backgrounds and thinking about, you know, Um, where they are in the frame and where the light's coming from. And so you have all that going through your head. Um, But you're doing a lot of squats. So at the end of the day, your legs are, you you forget how many times you've done that, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then then the other thing is, you know, the cameras are pretty heavy and you're trying to keep them pretty still when you're shooting. Um, And then you're just up and down and moving around. But And also the biggest thing about that is the end of the day, is the the mental fatigue after a shoot it's okay. amazing because it's such a high yeah when you're shooting right so you just you rush up and you're just you're you're really into it and then after you know you just like whew, you come right down and it's just like you're mentally exhausted but it's such a great exhaustion that's but, so, that's yeah. cool that um yeah. the way you describe that because i think with theater and music performance we feel we get that same effect mm-hmm. right yeah 100 percent. yeah the love yeah. of the arts yep. yeah and you definitely do. Yeah, and it, I said, you know, and certain events, you know, require certain types of like the number of frames you do. In the studio, I'm I'm usually shooting a lot less because it's a much more controlled environment. We were just out again with um, with Modell and some models, and we were shooting at the beach, out in um, in Wellington, and you know, and within three hours, I'd shot three thousand frames. Oh wow! Yeah, and because there you're dealing with light, you're dealing with wind, you're dealing with flowing dresses. So yeah, and it's the same thing at the end of it. I think you know, you're up and down, up and down, up and down. Because a lot of angles, a lot of great angles require you to be sort of lower looking up, and so you're, yeah, you're constantly doing it, and you're constantly carrying gear. But it is amazing because you get caught up in the moment, and then you don't think about it. It's just like okay. I have to run a marathon now for 60 minutes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I just saw some pictures that you did of the fashion show and they're just so fabulous. Just yeah. fabulous and yeah. inspirational yeah. and oh, they're so lucky that yeah. they had you to Yeah, it was good. Well, it's often a lot of that though comes, you know, that we have uh, some really interesting businesses here and then also Belleville has such a great backdrop to it. It's like that's one of the reasons why I came here. Like, you know, it's just such a beautiful town and the main street is so incredible. And it's so easy to get around here, but uh, I think we're really fortunate. I think people walk by the downtown and being in Toronto so long for work and then 
in the film industry where we're always hunting down locations, trying to find backdrops. And when you come here, it's like, it's a real gold mine. We have quite a special place in the downtown core. Yeah. Yeah. I think we really love talking to you about that. Um, The last time we saw you, because ever since that conversation, I, when I walk downtown, I'm looking for, where is Christopher seeing, what is he seeing? And I see it too. You know, it's kind of cool. And it's, and it's nice. And one of the neat things about photography too, in a lot of ways is you, you always have a subject matter that's really close to the lens or just in front of the lens in general, but a lot of the backgrounds, like you know, the bell tower or something that you think that is not very attractive or you think, well, why is that in the background? Usually just becomes a very beautiful dabbled paintbrush of blur. And when you have a city like this, has so much limestone and little alleys and, and great facades and stuff like that, it's really fantastic for a photographer, yeah. And now let's take a minute to thank one of the sponsors who made today's show possible. The City of Belleville supports the arts through the Arts and Culture Fund and the Mayor's Week of the Arts. If you're in the mood to look at art, take a stroll through the John M. Parrott Art Gallery, Belleville's premier publicly supported art gallery, which receives 93% of its operating fund from the city. If you're looking for a publicly funded museum, then take a stroll down Bridge Street to visit the Glenmore Museum and National Historic Site, home to artifacts reflecting the history of the Belleville region. How do you sort of visualize what's going to be a good background. I know that you've been doing it for a while, so yeah. you might have. But, you know, it's interesting, you know, even doing it so long, like after 40 years and, and working with so many, I think that's one of the things when you have great mentors and you work with people that are really talented in their craft, I think you have to have an eye for it. But a lot of times I just look for long raking backgrounds or things I can put in the background that are way out of focus. Um, and then where I can get find an angle of attack basically with a lens that's it's not very rarely am I shooting straight onto something unless it's onto a canvas or something like that but a lot of times for when I'm shooting sort of lifestyle stuff and out I'm always looking for just interesting backgrounds yeah yeah and then find certain light lighting's everything you know and so much stuff obviously um but you it is amazing I think that one of the things I think that's really misunderstood about photography I think people think that if I buy gear and I get this light, I can just pop it up, I see this video, and they look like they have a light right there, so I'll do the same thing. You can come close, but there's so many little things that you need to do as far as like just moving the talent an inch or raising the light like six inches or feathering a light off. It's quite surprising, actually, how much I don't use direct light. I use light that sort of spills around. It's a big thing, but yeah. So I'm always looking for light and looking for backgrounds, and yeah, but it's good, and it's... it's it, You'll never master it. You just you sort of master it to a point where you feel really comfortable. And yes, I can do this, but there's always something to learn. Is the commercial photography industry competitive right now, or is it more collegial? And has time changed that? Um, it's an interesting because I think with the commercial industry, there's not as many people, you know, not as many photographers or players in it. Just reason being. Um, it's very client based in the sense that you, you most of the time you need a studio and it's you're working with agencies or you're working with art directors or you're working with people that don't have uh, an agency or an art director and they're looking for someone who's had experience doing that to bring that knowledge to the table for them um, so I haven't found it there's a few I would say there's a lot less people in the commercial industry now than there has been just because also real estate you know with spacing if you're in the city Toronto, unfortunately, went through this great phase where they had such a huge film industry. But then, you know, as with anything in progress, unfortunately, the cost of the buildings start to get expensive, and then the artists are the ones to suffer because the artists have all the cool spaces, and we're always in these little warehouse areas. And then what happens is those areas start to get developed, and everybody wants to be there. And then the next thing you know, you know, all the photographers are getting kicked out. So mm-hmm. it's kind of tough that way. Uh, I've been fortunate. Um, just because of being a commercial photographer, I've had lots of clients and a very good understanding of the advertising agency and people have come, I've come from that background. So that really helps. And I, I bring that approach to pretty much everything I do, no matter what it is, whether it's a simple headshot or a simple little product shot, or even if we go to the beach and, you know, you think, well, they're just shooting fashion and they're people in, in, you know, wardrobe, it, everything has such a, such a process to get to that point. So I always treat it, it's a, everything is a, is a shoot that has a lot of moving parts to it. Yeah. I love hearing about your expertise. Um, Do you have advice for emerging photographers or emerging commercial photographers? Yeah, I would say that I think most of the photographers that are getting into the industry or want to get into the industry is there, a lot of them wait to think that, well, I'm 
you know, I'm just waiting to get hired or, or I'm waiting for a client. And that's usually, you should just be shooting all the time. And because so many personal creatives are great ways to basically develop your craft and, and you know, hone your skills. And also a lot of that work, the personal work is very, it's very important to the work that you're going to get as a paying photographer. And, um, because you, you're developing a sense of style, and then you're just it's practice, 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 and so many people don't practice. Like it's, it would shock people, I think, if they saw how many I shoot almost every day, except mm. on the weekends. But then I'm still shooting when I'm shooting my sunsets. I'm out all the time in the evening, and I am a bit obsessed. I think if you're going to be a commercial photographer, you need to be extremely obsessed, and you need to be really wanting to just get better, get better, get better. And I, you know, and I look at every job I've done. I look at the past. I look back. 10, 15, 20, 30 years, and I think, oh, I remember I was on set, and the guy was doing this, and now I'm doing it, or I'm trying to remember something of how they did something, and that's just practice, and I think that my advice is just, yeah, practice as much as you possibly can. Don't get hung up about the gear, because I've seen, I have so many friends that are such good photographers, and they don't have really expensive gear, Mm -hmm. but they're great artists, and they have a great eye, right, Mm -hmm. and uh, so... Yeah, I mean, gear is great, and it and it, it makes it easy. Like when we're shooting tethered into the computers and the images are coming up, that part's really fantastic. And it's really nice because I try to engage a lot of my clients. I think that would be the other thing I would say to photographers. I know a lot of photographers, they're very I, – and I hear this a lot from talent and how they say, well, they don't get to really see the images or the photographer doesn't talk to them that much or they almost like don't want to show them what they're shooting, which is the weirdest thing mm-hmm. for me because the way I get – you know you get great images and you get a great shot is it when people come down and they can see what they're doing and then you say well i really love this and usually i'll shoot maybe on a portrait i might shoot 10 or 12 frames and then we stop and i say well let's look at what we're doing and then we come over and we look at the screens and and they get really you know engaged in it too right Mm -hmm. so then they feel a real part of it and they say you know i really love this and then they get a great understanding it's very difficult i hate standing on the other side of the camera when i'm pre-lighting something and I'm thinking, oh, I have to get a picture of myself. Or, or I'm testing the light. And you realize that's the hard side of the camera to be on. Yeah. It's really challenging. And so if you have a photographer, if you have someone who's not really chatting with you about what they're doing or what they see or what's in frame, it can be, it can be you know, very tricky. But I think it, once you do that, and I notice that from a, a lot of the models, and I think when I'm shooting here from Odell, the one comment I get all the time is, oh, you're so talkative and you – you really explain what you're doing and you show us. And, and I think that's because that's the commercial background because okay. we are so in commercials, you have an art director and you have an agency producer and you have a lot of clients and they want to see what you're doing. So you make sure you're going in the right direction. So that's something I've just sort of taken over into, even if it's personal shooting, it's the same way, right? So Especially with portraits. Communication and partnership with Absolutely. your client. Yeah, it's huge. Yeah, yeah, it's huge. And I think, you know, it's just I say, shoot as much as you possibly can and don't get caught up with the gear. It's like, uh, and like to go sort of back to that, like if we all had the same paint here and the same canvas and the same paintbrush, we'd all come up with something different. And someone's <laughs> probably going to paint better than, than the other two of us mm-hmm. but I mean and that's just I'm the at the bottom <laughs> I'm, I'll take that role I stick man is, is as far as I can yeah. go so. but it's a, I think it's a good it's a it's a good way to look at it it's just like you know it's it's like learning your craft and you can when it comes to the gear we can all have the same equipment but one of us is going to be better than the other person yeah. even with the same equipment and that's just the nature of the beast I think that's within every job you know but yeah. uh, don't get too caught up in that and just keep practicing and don't be afraid of making mistakes. And the other huge thing I think that a lot of photographers are worried about, they're worried about when they take a job or they go to do something that they think that every step has to be perfect. And that's not true. There's yeah. so many times where you have to be able to say, this isn't working. You know, I'm going to change the light or I'm going to change this up and admit it. And just because, and it's great. I think when a client hears that, they're not going to be like, oh, because they'll see that now oh, this it's always a process. It's never, you have an idea in your head, but sometimes, you know, especially with this kind of industry, it's, it's a very fluid um, industry and a very fluid job and it's because it, you're creating constantly every moment. Yeah. The, di- the diversity in your artistry is inspiring. Mm, thank you. Let's talk food art. Oh, I know. Food's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> I love food because, uh, you know, uh, I grew up in a family that we loved food. My mom loved to cook. I love to cook. And uh, I have a great person I work with, Ruth Gangbar, and she's local, and she's worked in the Toronto film industry forever, and she's an amazing food stylist. And uh, so we basically hooked up quite a few years ago. She asked me about doing some food, and, and it was a really great connection because she's amazing at doing food, 
and um, and I love shooting food and I love eating food. So and food is really interesting because I think that. Uh, especially when it comes to food stylings for photographers mm-hmm. and for clients and people say, well, why do you want to bring in a food stylist? And especially if you're, you have a chef who makes amazing food, but, um, photographers need, it's like when you need a wardrobe person and you need a hair person and you need someone to tweak something, you need a food stylist to tweak the food to camera. That's usually what the big thing is. It's not that they're going to change the chef's food. And so you're always trying to sometimes explain that. Uh, most chefs will understand that, right? And they'll go, oh, great, just make my... They have beautiful plates, but there's always something you have to do. And, it's got to be perfect. It's like, got to be perfect, yeah, yeah. yeah. And there's so many little things. Like you can have an olive bowl and, you know, you need to add three more olives mm-hmm. or you need to move a piece of bread 25 times to get it in the right spot. And trust me, that happens a lot. <laughs> but at the end of the day, you know, like a, an average plate of food will get set down and it'll take us usually about 100 captures to get to the one that we're going to use. And then a lot of times um, in commercial photography, especially in, you know, when you, especially because you're shooting stills, you can do six, seven images and you can build an image. So you don't have to light every single thing. You might okay. light a part of it. And then you can say, okay, and then I'll put a little shiny board in for something and then I'll composite that together. And so you learn all these little tricks. But yeah, food is great. And we, I did Quinnylicious here two years ago and um, it was really an amazing project to work on yeah cool so what's more challenging food art or working with Muppets <laughs> oh yeah <laughs> <laughs> Muppets. actually maybe you could give our listeners a bit of the background oh, about the yeah. Muppets okay so the, the background on the Muppets oh my god it makes me laugh to think about it um, oh, I was a production assistant. I got this call to go work on this project that was in um, out of town, and they wouldn't tell you what it was. And so I think you know they didn't want people to know that you were going to be working on the Muppets. So it turned out that I got this phone call to be, uh, you know, I was basically a gopher. I was a production assistant at the time, and it was for Jim Henson and the Muppets, and they were in Toronto shooting the Miss Piggy special. And it was. She's my favorite. Oh, I know. She was like, oh yeah. It's that was a really interesting experience because if you're familiar, obviously I think most people are familiar with the Muppets, but um, the people that run the Muppets, like the people that you know, the puppeteers, they are those. You know, they are the characters. They are the characters, and it was really, really incredible. And so the energy. Oh yeah, and the whole (laughs) sets, all the whole world. So they're all rolling around on chairs because the sets are all up like six feet because they're holding the puppets above them. And back then, I think that was sort of in you know puppeteering there wasn't a lot of special effects so everything mm-hmm. was real but it was great to work in like the Muppet control room like on the Muppet show because I watched cool. the Muppet show and it was really really amazing right Beaker but, oh Beaker we one of my faves <laughs> I have a signed poster of all the original cast this, oh this cool really, yeah, from the Muppet show when we did that and it was great I worked with Jim Henson I was his assistant and this other gentleman named Martin uh, Baker and they were in but Richard Hunt was the he was Beaker and uh, all the different characters, Frank Oz and all of them. And then they had a lot of celebrities that were coming in because that show was endless for celebrities. Like everybody yeah. wanted to be on the Muppet show. Yeah. So that was really, really fun. And picking up like, you know, Shirley MacLaine and uh, John Ritter, George Hamilton, all these cast yeah. people at the time and driving them around, Priscilla Presley. And yeah, so you always have a story about Yeah, they always have a story. Them, eh? yeah, 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 each one of them. But it was just amazing. But the, uh, the best thing for me was that when the, when the characters, the Muppets were out, they had to be alive. So when it, they were never like, uh, that was the golden rule. And it was really funny because he, people would be walking by and these things would be interacting or they'd start touching you and doing, you know, and looking at you. That's and, insane. You no, know, it was really insane. And they really were alive. Like yeah. it was really incredible. They were real characters. Yeah. But that was a really fun experience. And yeah. And, and that, you, once again, you take something away from that. Like, you know, I was in the control room. We were throwing like paper airplanes and I met <laughs> tons of people in the film industry. So it's funny to see those scenes where there's total chaos and you realize you were behind the scenes doing some of that stuff. Yeah, right? you knew what was happening. Oh, yeah, yeah. And yeah. then you take those experiences away from you. Like, you know, because we worked on a lot of sets for risers. I remember working on, I had to do this for Mary Brown's chicken. And we had to, um, I had this chicken and we were doing basically a Bugs Bunny Roadrunner gag. And the chicken had to walk over he was on this huge white table like this, but basically it was like 12 by 12, all white. And then there was a propane tank and chicken feed. And the idea was this chicken walks across and then he, he sees the pile <laughs> of chicken feed and he eats it. And then he super inflates and he sh- goes shooting up into the sky. And, uh, and it's like Mary Brown's chicken is plumper than, you know, most chickens. And so it was, a, but it was a total Bugs Bunny Roadrunner gag, right? But the crazy thing was that, so when I designed the set, the whole set was white and we had this chicken, and he was in this white world, and then we had a total Roadrunner gag, just like free bird feed, mm-hmm, right? Mm-hmm. And the 
chicken wrangler, so-called. It's like cat wranglers, right? I don't really think they exist. I've worked <laughs> on a lot of cat shoots. It's pretty crazy. But the chicken wrangler puts the chicken on the surface, and she trained it at home, right? Because that's what they do. And wow. They keep training and training and training for a couple of weeks. And the chicken's supposed to walk over and get the feed. And the cinematographer that I'm working with, my friend Steve Vernon in California, was up doing this job with me. And, he, and I'm directing this commercial, and he says, okay, the chicken is supposed to walk over, right? And the chicken would move. He just oh, stood there no. and stood there. Oh, no, all that training. All that training. And it's because he had a depth perception, because the floor was all white in the studio, and the world that he was standing on was white, and he wouldn't move. Oh, and the trainer should have known that, oh, yeah, don't was, you think? Oh, yeah. And so, because we told him <laughs> what we were going to do, right? But then finally, it took a little while, and finally, he just watched his chicken do this slow little step. And then when he realized the surface was hard, because he's just looking at the food, and he wanted to go. But then right. he finally made the, the trek across. He finally but, did it. Yeah. But that's kind of the crazy stuff you wind up in the film industry. And that's the great part about the commercial side of things, too, is that clients come to you with all kinds of wacky ideas, and they want you to execute things that you normally wouldn't do. How right. about Dan Aykroyd? Was that... Um, well, Dan Aykroyd's Crystal Head Vodka. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And so I was, I was working with a friend of mine, and we were shooting these. He wanted a bunch of um, liquor bottles shot for a pitch he was doing, and one of them was the Crystal Head Vodka bottle. Right. And when I saw that, I was like, okay, you know what? We're not going to have enough time in the day to uh, <laughs> deal Execute with that one. Execute what his vision one. was, yeah. So then after... I wound up photographing that one, and it came out really well. And so gorgeous, I had a, yeah. more than just really well. Those yeah. are that's a gorgeous yeah. campaign. Thanks. <laughs> and then so I had it on the website, and then I got a call from um, uh, from Crystal Head about coming in, and, and they wanted to buy that image. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, sure. So I said, well, what is it you're looking for? And I met with them, and it turned out they were they were in Toronto and really really close. And I went up there, and then I wound up saying, well, you know, if you give me some more vodka, vodka bottles, I can shoot you a couple demos to so, see what you think. And that's how that all started. I just wow. basically, and that's goes back to like, you know, just practicing and doing something. And then it, you know, uh, that kind of work does turn into paying work. It, there is, a, you know, a yeah. pot of gold at the end of the rainbow, hopefully, but it does work. It does pay off. Yeah. yeah. But yeah. yeah, so I've shot a lot of over the five, last five years, I've done a lot of stuff for Crystal Head Vodka. But as with a lot of client stuff, you wind up shooting all the campaigns at all the boxes and all the posters, and then you get a lull. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. as a corp as a commercial photographer you need to have a lot of you know f uh, pokers in the fire yeah yeah because a lot of clients dry up i and, think or take we, a break we find that with artists of many different genres that it mm -hmm. is um it's a case-by-case -case basis right we need to how do we keep that wheel how do we keep that how wheel do you keep turning? it going yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. And i think you need to you know in the I, it was interesting because in the film industry, when I was directing, and as for a lot of directors, and the same with a lot of cinematographers, there was this concern that, you know, well, if you only photograph milk, you can't photograph beer. Like, really? it really was like that. Really? It was very, very tricky for a lot of people. Or if, you know, you've just worked with kids, you can't work with grown-ups. And the, you got very pigeonholed. Hmm. And I had to fight that for a long time. So, and so did a lot of other, you know, the people that I worked with. They were, you know, a lot of those directors and a lot of the cinematographers because they were, they wanted to work all the time and they were super talented at their craft. But it was very difficult because you were dealing with such a competitive industry. There were so many guys that were just people shooters mm -hmm. and so many guys that were just, you know, beer shooters and milk shooters. And so you, um, you wound up working very hard to not get pigeonholed. And so I wound up really making sure that when I was turned to photography after I was finished directing that, and I just said, okay, you know what, it has the best of all the worlds. And that was the one reason why I did that was because the industry was changing a little bit and I loved cinematography and I loved my cameras and I loved directing and I loved the production side of things of building a shoot and putting it together and working right. with a team of people. It was a natural progression to be a commercial photographer. And then when I did that, um, it, it just worked out really, really well that way. But it was important, yeah. Now let's take a minute to thank one of the sponsors who made today's show possible, Bay of Quinty Tourism. If you're looking for something fun to do in the Quinty region, then look no further than Bay of Quinty Tourism. They have it all planned out for you. Grab a copy of the 8th edition of the Bay of Quinty Discovery Guide to start planning your next adventure in the Quinty region. Back to the diversity of your mm. art landscapes oh yeah we are our team is in love with your landscapes and um well thank you yeah for, it's yeah. just so inspiring yeah and yeah it's been really great that project i started in covid when we were all on a break i was waiting for the studio to get finished here in belleville 
and because there were delays with um, contractors. And I have so many great views in Prince Edward County. I sort of face north, so the sun sets to my left, and uh, I have a really nice raking sunset that comes across. And I just, you know, I started shooting more and more of those, and I realized what was really interesting about that was I was in pretty much the same three feet of an area that I shoot from all the time. But it just so dramatically keeps changing and yeah, changing. Yeah, you're and seeing changing. something different Dipping by the time. minute sometimes, right? Yeah, by the right? minute, right? And I shoot a lot of other different stuff in landscapes and things, but that's just sort of been a little personal project. And I'm hoping to make a coffee table book out of it one day. But I think you should, yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah, there yeah. is a big project yeah. of that in some way, yeah, for sure. Yeah, I just thought it'd be cool to have like 30 pages of like, like what you guys did for me, which was amazing when you did the double page spread. That's right. kind of the concept. And uh, it looked so, it was so nice to see that in print. And, and you know, I have to print more stuff because as a commercial photographer, you're, you're just going from one job to the next. And we're in such a digital world. Mm -hmm. And it really is. When you see something printed, it's, it's it really different. the end. It's, it's very, very different. Yeah, it's like it when really you look is. at stuff on the wall and painting and it's done, right? It's so different. Yeah. Yeah. That landscape view I saw last week, you did the storm. Oh, the storm one. Yeah. yeah. Really yeah. I'm amazed that the water's not changing. Yeah. Like it's changing color wise, but it yeah. still has that calmness. It's such a beautiful yeah. spot. I wonder what it, it made me think, what does it look like when it's not calm when it's yeah and it's tricky because stirred I've, up yeah if it has to be really stirred up if you want to do it because a lot of times i'm shooting like a maybe a one minute exposure or two minute exposure so if that happens and it's really stirred up then you get a beautiful like ghosting in the water because okay, the water yeah. just blurs but if it's in between it's a bit tricky so a lot of times i'm waiting for it to be kind of glassy which mm -hmm. it usually especially in the summer and then you get that lovely reflection mm -hmm. and it keeps building and building and there's been so many times i'll be like, okay it's over and then I go back in and I'm like, oh crap, I'm running back out. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, and I'm like, you should learn that lesson by now, Christopher. It's like, you know, you, it's not over till, you know, to the very end till it's completely dark. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's so cool. Yeah. So you, you're from here, but you worked in Toronto and then came back. And I've been seeing sort of an influx of creators from Toronto moving to this area. Do you think there might be a shift in the creative industries from like the bigger cities to a smaller sort of? I Town? think they're just seeing what I'm doing. They're coming down here to steal my work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, of course. No. The great eyes see see where they should be. And it is funny. Here though, is where it should be. Yeah, I have a lot of friends who look at what I'm doing and they go, Belleville, where's Belleville? Where's that? And they're yeah. like, why are you going there? It's just like, oh. And then other, you know, there was another group that totally understood that. And they thought, you know, because I think you get to a certain point where you have not mastered your craft, but I mean, I could say, yeah, I probably have mastered my craft in the sense that I feel very comfortable when I do a project. But you feel like, okay, you know what, I've done as much as I can do sort of where I am, and you start to feel a bit stagnant, which is kind of a weird mm -hmm. thing to say. Would you feel like in Toronto, you think, well, there's got to be tons of different stuff. But when I was out here and I started doing more and more stuff, you know, in Prince Edward County and around and stuff, and then Belleville was just like this ideal location, and it really, it, for me, is such a diamond in the rough. And I think that, I think what people see here is that there's a real community of artists floating around, and the more that come, the more we start connecting and it's amazing, like how many people I've met here that are all uh, there's other photographers, and you know it's great to get together and chat about stuff, and you know because we all do different things, so it's not like you ever worry about you know oh well you're taking my work, and I have this rule that basically I don't approach anybody's client, which is a good rule to have I think because you know unless a client approaches me then you know why are you coming, but I you know so I never really worry about that, but I think. For people coming here, I think more and more people are coming here. It's just, A, the lifestyle. Um, and it's like I think the talent pool is shifting. I think Toronto has become a very expensive place. And when that happens and you're worried about rent and you're worried about where jobs are going to come from, then the creative vision and the creative you know juice inside you gets, gets slammed and, and is not happening anymore. So when you come here, like it's been the most creative two years I've ever had. It, it's, it's shocking because it's been such a – a run to, to to meet all these new people and say well let's just shoot let's just do this and get together and you know and you kind of change direction a little bit when you meet people like when I met Leah and, and at Modell you know and I went into the door and I, I introduced myself because I was trying to introduce myself to as many people as possible Jean-Marc from Auberge who've done tons of food photography for him amazing and you know and you just sort of tour around and and I think that people are extremely approachable here and and it's a great area but I think that you know there's a it's just going to get bigger and bigger and bigger. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I think, but a lot of people like coming here because it's, it's a nice place to live, but it's also, it's a real creative hub. Mm -hmm. yeah. When you talk about um, the community really being welcoming, I've felt the same way being newer yeah, to the community. Exactly. And I, 
I really like the aspect and maybe it's the sign of the times that we're now collegial and working together yeah. and yeah. crossing projects together yeah. amongst different artists of different genres is such an ex exciting move yeah. forward I yeah. think as well yeah no exactly and, and Bob has a real um, which is interesting because I think when you when you meet photographers or you meet artists it's interesting to see how much work they have that, you, that hasn't surfaced right or yeah. it's not back in you know it's not up in front of you and because we've all done so many things but Bob is a crazy amount of work yeah like you know that's what I love about him he's always like you know I'll talk about something. Goes, I have a picture of that. I'm oh, like, really? Oh, oh my God. Funny. He's like, where have you not been? Yeah. You know, or not have a photo of, or he has, and he has great stories. And, um, and he, which is really funny. It's sort of going to bring me around to Marina, who, um, her dad, William, who I met, and I photographed him recently as a portrait. And they had like a pool hall business here ages ago. And he was a really interesting guy to photograph. Yeah. And uh, I always think, you know, we should be doing more of that because there's so many people that, are you know getting older but they know Belleville so well and they all had incredible businesses and they have so many great stories and they you know and when I started talking to him it's just so fascinating hearing about him as a business here and what his family did and so many of them have done and thinking okay you need to you need to be photographed and then you need to like have a little blurb on you yeah have your your story told yeah, you, yeah. maybe that's a display an exhibit yeah. here for the gallery yeah. would be yeah. The would be really cool. Belleville and their story. That'd be yeah. really cool. Yeah, It'd people and their so stories because awesome. there's so many, right? It's yeah. incredible, mm -hmm. you know. And it's like uh, my uncle Charlie Raycroft of the Raycrofts here. Then um, he, it's amazing. And the same thing. I talked to him, and, and it's when he came downtown, it was interesting. And he came by the studio. They were very excited for me to be, you know to be here. They've been in Belleville pretty much all their life, the Raycrofts. But when he saw the renovations that were going on in the downtown, he said, you know what, it's really amazing to see because it's going back to where it was. Nice. Because it used to be such a happening place. It really was. And yeah. he's one of those characters too, right? You know, they've been around forever. And, and um, But I just thought, oh, that would be a cool project. You know, just find all these interesting people, do these really cool portraits, and then a little blurb because they have such a cool history and a connection, to, especially to our downtown. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And heritage. And that's, I think part of the arts nowadays is yeah. we need to preserve our heritage as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. to draw into you get to draw one of our brain pool questions. Oh, yeah. You get to so reach into the skull. Now we're going to learn about Christopher the person. <clears throat> Here's my question. If you could go to Mars, would you? Why or why not? I would. I bet the sunsets there are incredible. Yeah. <laughs> Such yeah. a photographer That's answer yeah. to that one. <laughs> totally makes sense. Did you see those? And no one would have shot them, so I'm like, okay, yeah. Did you see the new, um, oh, what is that? Oh, I can't remember. From the, the new the satellite, satellite, the, the new oh, space images. pictures. <gasps> is this just recent? Oh, oh yeah. They're, so oh, they're amazing. Wow. I'll send yeah. you the link. Ooh, it's, I have to see those. Yeah, yeah they're gorgeous. It's just out yeah, of this that, world. Definitely, for sure. Mm -hmm. I would take my camera. Yeah, yeah that would Extra be good. batteries. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no. Well, that's a good question. Yeah, I like that one. Oh, he's getting excited, I think. Oh, well, yeah. Take another one. All right. This one here in the back. Oh, Cody, we forgot to do the round table, though. Round we have table. to ask everybody at the oh. table. Mm. What, Would you, you go to Mars, Heather? Why not? I just love adventure, so I'd head out wherever the opportunity was. I'd, I'd give it a try, for sure. See, currently you can't come back, so... Oh, so... Oh, that's part of it? That yeah. wasn't part of well, the question. <laughs> oh, so I can't come back? Well, if you can't come back, but, like, if... Okay, as the question is written... Could I, would I just go to Mars? Yeah, sure. But I'm a Doctor Who fan. Like, I would, if a madman in a blue box was like, do you want to explore all of space and time? I'd be like, yeah, that, I'm down. Like, okay. Oh, okay. Then I would say, no, I would not. No, I wouldn't either. I have too many things <laughs> left here to shoot. <laughs> yeah, there's... <laughs> <laughs> and to all my clients, I'm not going to Mars. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Call me down the street. <laughs> yeah. All right. Have you completed anything on your bucket list? Oh, did anything on my bucket list okay yeah I would say yes because on my bucket list I was like to open a new studio in a new town and you know and sort of go in a different direction a little bit which I have done yeah so I've been shooting more and more fashion portraits which is just basically part of the portrait world and they're commercial and so yeah that has worked out really really well because I think it's you know it's forward movement and I, I'm doing something creating something new all the time I really get j jazzed out of that. I have to say that, you know, in general, just anything I do at the end of the day, 
and, I, and as long as if I'm shooting, I'm in my studio, or we go out on the street, and you come back, and you start looking at images, it's just yeah, really gets me going. That's so exciting to hear because I love when people are able to work um, their work is inspired because of their passion. We're such fortunate people when we can oh, yeah. work in yeah. what ma- what we're passionate about. Yeah. I know my neighbors are always that because, you know, everybody follows the feed and social media and, you know, and it's very important and, it, and it's nice to have it for so people can see it and sort of see what you're doing and, and potential clients. And there's sort of two sides, I think, to that. But I think that, yeah, having the passion, it's great. But at the end of the day, I just feel so, you know, so great. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But it's really weird because so on my bucket list. Yeah, I think that. And, and coming here, like I love driving through the country, you know, past all the little cows and stuff and down the fields to come to my studio. I mean, I could be in my studio 24 seven to, to tell you the truth. It's just like, it's such a fun environment and you have all your toys there, but it's, you know, it goes back to, yeah, the, uh, the new community, the, the, the group of people, the studio, the sort of new direction and moving forward. And, and yeah, and I, I think I have some of the best work that I've done in a very, very long time, you know, and a part of that is just because of the, the new focus and the new direction. How about your bucket list? Yeah. I think a lot of my bucket list is acting related, and I've been pursuing that pretty hard lately. So. Good. Oh, right on. So where yes. are you doing that? Um, at the Pinnacle Playhouse. Oh, um, this October, I will be in Vanya and Sonia and Masha and Spike. Wow. I will be playing Nina. So. Well, you have that fab red hair. Yeah, it's going to be so exciting. I can't wait to see oh, it. It'll yeah. be my first time seeing you on the stage. Super cool. Yeah. And you? Um, my bucket list is changing all the time. <laughs> uh, yeah, I guess this is going to sound totally geeky, but one thing on my bucket list was to go and do the Sound of Music tour oh. uh, in Austria. So I did that, oh, and wow. that was super exciting. I actually brought uh, eight colleagues of mine. We were singing in a choir together, and we were touring in Germany. And I said, let's just add a couple more days onto our trip and go do the Sound of Music tour. So no, I can check great. that one off. and. Yeah, there's lots more to come, but I don't know. That list is changing all the time. Yeah, I kind of forget what's on it because once you do something, it comes off and it's just time to move on to the next one. Yep. And it's one of those things, I mean, you see that and I think stuff inspires you and depending on what kind of career you're into. Like when you say Sound of Music, of course, it goes to my head. It's like the sets. and the Oh, yeah. And just it's so incredible, right? It is. Yeah. Um, and then when you see some of the, the spots where they shot, yeah. and some t- sometimes it's a little bit, it was a little deflating because the cinematographer got it right yes and just just did such an amazing job and made it magical yeah that once you were there it the Mm. it maybe didn't have the exact magical moment like the gazebo yeah oh it was a bit of a letdown letdown, yeah yeah but (laughs) kudos to the yeah the filmmakers for filmmakers yeah for making that such a magical and it's interesting i mean there's there's that side of illusion i think that you know even in the industry I work in, there's so much of it. There's so many different facets of what you want to do, whether you want to be like, you know, do a lot of composites, whether you want to do you know, 3D CGI stuff, whether you're more, you know, in camera. So we're all different like that, which is great because it just, it's a lot of, you know, mm-hmm. different recipes out there. I'm more natural because of, of the film industry for me. So I try to do as much as I possibly can in camera. I do have to composite some shots together, but they're usually, there's no real magic to it. Um, it's just, yeah. Is there anything else you uh, that we haven't covered that you want to talk about? Um, I don't know. I guess I take people ask me where I get my inspiration from, and I think you know I definitely take it from. Do I look to other photographers? I definitely look to some of the you know the big name photographers for sure, like the Richard Avedons, the Irving Pens, the Maros Testinos. Um, there's so many, and I and I'm constantly cruising Pinterest. Uh, and that, which is an amazing platform, by the way. I mean, it's incredible how much f- amazing photography is out there. And I think one of the hard things for photographers is that you know, up and coming photographers, is there's so much amazing work that's out there that you see on these social platforms. I think that it, it gets people discouraged and you shouldn't let it get you discouraged because you have to realize that it's very, you know, anybody can put an image up on social media. And I think when you have a client that comes to your door or you're working and doing something, it's, those, it's two different worlds. But it's really important to have. I mean, I definitely use social media. I use my Instagram account. I use my Facebook because they reach markets that a lot of people don't, you know, that's instantly where they go. But I always ask clients when I talk to people, I can always say to them, you know, well, take a look at my website and then look at that work there. If you see something you like, let me know. And it's amazing how that comes back around because they say, oh, I love this shot or I love this shot. And it may not be 
they may not be able to do that, but at least it gives me a really good understanding for what it is they're looking for. Mm-hmm. Yeah, mm-hmm. and so, you know, and I think you need to be inspired by other stuff. So I'm always looking for inspiration, whether it's painters or, yeah, other, you know, a lot of, I think it's really incredible to see the look at what some of the, when it goes back to gear, people talk about, well, gear is so important, but I think mean, most of the, a lot of the photography we look at is so old from the 60s or 50s and mm-hmm. 70s that the gear was not that great, mm-hmm. right? And you sort of look at their stuff and you go, wow, they were doing it. It was all just more about story. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Awesome. This has been a, a great discussion. We've really learned a lot from you. I love hearing um, people talk about the city and oh yeah, how no. they love Thank it you. and everything. Um, can you just give us your socials so people can find you? Oh, yeah. So my Facebook, you can find me. My website is uh, ChristopherGentile.ca, and my um, Instagram account is Photography. and it's the same with my uh, Facebook. Thanks so much for being here today. Yeah. Well, thank, thank you very much for having me. It was a pleasure.